In this presentation, I will be talking about the osteology of the upper limb. I will be concentrating on some of the bony points that are fractured easily. Also the areas of the bone where the nerves comes in contact. The shoulder girdle, which is made by the clavicle and the scapula and the humerus connects the upper limb with the axial skeleton, which is the central part of the body. The humerus forms the bone of the upper limb, especially in the area of the arm. The forearm is formed by the two bones. On the medial side, we see this bone is the ulna. On the lateral side, the bone which we are looking here is the radius. The hand is formed by many number of bones. There are a set of carpals, metacarpals and phalanges. In the upper limb, we always use the word proximal and the distal. Proximal is the area which is nearer to the midline. So where the limb comes and connects with the body. There are eight carpal bones setting in the two rows the proximal row contains the four carpals and the distal row contains the rest of the four carpals. Metacarpals are five in number. The phalanges form the fingers and the thumb. In the fingers there are three sets of phalanges, four proximal, four middle and four distal. In case of thumb, there is only two. There is a proximal phalanx and the distal phalanx. Scapula is a flat, triangular bone and it lies on the posterior aspect of the chest wall, extending from the second rib to the seventh rib. It has three borders, superior, medial, and the lateral. It has three angles, superior, inferior, and the lateral. It is not attached directly to any bone of the axillus skeleton but it's mostly attached indirectly by the muscles. This gives a very free movement of a scapula and the free movement of a scapula indirectly gives a wide range of the movement of the upper limb. Lateral angle contains the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. This glenoid cavity articulates with the head of the humerus and forms the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. There is two processes. This process is known as acromion process and this beak-like projection is called as coracoid process. This area here is called as spine of the scapula and which divides this posterior surface into two halves. The superior part of this area gives attachment to the supraspinatus muscle, while the lower part gives attachment to the infraspinatus muscle. On this model, we are looking at the internal surface of the scapula. This is the superior angle, and my pointer is going over the superior edge or the superior border of the scapula. When I come to the lateral edge, this is the area of the suprascapular notch containing the suprascapular nerve. And the ligament shown here in white attaches to the base of the coracoid process to the superior edge and changes the notch into a foramen. The nerve passes through here to come onto the external surface of the scapula to supply the supraspinatus muscle, which is this muscle, and passes into the inferior surface of the 
spine to supply the infraspinatus muscle. So let me talk about the fracture of the clavicle. This is one of the bone which is fractured very frequently. As I told you, the, this is the weak area where the medial two-third is meeting the lateral one-third. And this is where the clavicle is frequently fractured. The condition usually happens when there is a direct force applied from the lateral end of the clavicle or when we fall on the outstretched hand and the force breaks this point. The medial two-third of the clavicle is pulled up and because of the attachment of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The lateral end of the clavicle is pulled down with the weight of the arm and the adductors of the arms. So what happens when you examine the patient, there is overriding of the two segments. The usually the medial segments overrides the lateral segment. Humerus is the longest bone of the upper limb. It has a upper end, the lower end and the shaft. The round area here, one third of the sphere is the head of the humerus. This constricted area around the head is the anatomical neck of the humerus. The anatomical neck gives attachment to the capsule of the joint. This slender area where the, the upper end is joining the shaft, this area is called as surgical neck of the humerus. There is two bumps here. The small projection here or bump is called as lesser tubercle and on this side here is called as greater tubercle. Lesser tubercle gives attachment to subscaparis muscle, the medial rotator of the shoulder, and the greater tubercle contains some smooth areas which are attachment of the rotator cuff muscles. The rotator cuff muscles are very important for the stability of the joint. Between the two tubercle, there is a groove this is known as bicipital groove or the intertubercular groove. This contains the long head of the biceps. This groove has two lips. There is a lateral lip, there is a medial lip. This gives attachment to two muscles of the upper limb, the pec major and the teres major. The floor of this groove gives attachment to latissimus dorsi muscle. There's a mnemonic which goes as lady between the two major. So the two majors are attaching on to the two sides where the lady is the latissimus dorsi which lies into the floor of the groove. Looking at the shaft, there are two important features. On the lateral surface, there is a V-shaped projection or tuberosity which is called as deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity gives attachment to the deltoid muscle, which is a strong abductor of the upper arm. On the posterior aspect, there is a very shallow groove. This groove here is called a spiral groove, and the spiral groove lodges the radial nerve. The lower end of the humerus is expanded and it is irregular. On the medial aspect, this is a fully like structure is trochlea, which joins with the ulna. On this lateral aspect, this is a round head like looking area joins with the radius, which is called as capitulum. On each side, we see two bumps, condyles. Condylus in Greek means bumps. The medial epicondyle is very prominent, and the lateral epicondyle is a smaller projection here. 
Medial epicondyle clinically is very important because on the posterior aspect, there is a groove here. This groove contains the ulna nerve. Let me summarize some of the areas where the nerves come in contact with the humerus. And clinically, a fracture of that area can entrap the nerve. Upper end, around the surgical neck, we see the relationship of the humerus with the axillary nerve. With the fracture of the surgical neck, the axillary nerve can be entrapped in this area. The second area is onto the posterior aspect of the shaft in the spiral groove. The spiral groove, when it gets fractured and involves the radial nerve, it can cause the wrist drop. Let me tell you about the Saturday night palsy. On the Saturday when you are watching the movie, you take the arm and put it over the couch. While doing that, you are crushing the radial nerve between the couch and the spiral groove, which gives the numbness and paresthesia on the arm and the forearm. The third side, which I would like to show you, is the posterior aspect of the medial apicondyle. The medial apicondyle, on the posterior aspect, this is the position of the ulna nerve and a fracture of the medial epicondyle can entrap the ulna nerve. The fourth site is the supracondylar region, which is just above the condyles. This is the area where a fracture can enclose or entrap the median nerve. Radius is the lateral bone of the forearm or the antibrachium. It has got a head, neck, the body, and the lower end. The head is a disc-shaped structure. It joins with the capitulum of the humerus. It joins with the ulna to form the superior radioulnar joint. It rotates around a ligament which attaches around the head, the radius rotates in supination and pronation. This con constricted area here is the neck of the radius. This rough area is called as radial tuberosity, gives attachment to the biceps muscle. The head joins with the capitulum of the humerus. This sharp area of the shaft is called the introscious border, gives attachment to the introscious membrane. The introscious membrane joins the two bones together. The force from the lower end of the radius from the hand passes through the introscious membrane into the ulna and passes through the upper end of the, of the ulna to the humerus. The lower end of the radius has a smooth anterior surface. This lies just underneath very subcutaneously. This area here where I've got my pointer is position of the radial arteries and that's where we feel the radial pulse. On the lateral aspect, there's a projection which is called a styloid process of the radius. And if we come onto the posterior aspect, there is a small bump. This area here is called as dorsal tubercle or the Lester's tubercle. Anna is the medial bone of the forearm. Something different about this uh, bone, the head of this long bone lies distally. We have seen previously in the radius the head lies Proximally, in the humerus, the head lies again proximally.
The upper end of the ulna contains three distinct features. This projection here is called as coronoid process. In the Greek, coronoid means crow-like. The projection on the posterior aspect is known as olecranon process. And the olecranon means, in the again, it's a Greek word showing the point of the elbow. The olecranon lies in the olecranon and fossa of the, in full extension, it lies in the olecranon fossa of the humerus. The coronoid process in full flexion, which is this movement here, lies into the fossa, and this fossa is, is the coronoid fossa. So in full extension, the whole coronoid process and lodges into the fossa. This area here is known as trochlear notch. The trochlear notch joins with the trochlea of the humerus to form the elbow joint. This sharp border of the, on the shaft joins with the interosseous membrane of the radius. The head has got a small little projection. This is called as the stalard process of the anna. Let me talk about the fracture of the scaphoid bone. The scaphoid is a very commonly fractured carpal bone. It also transmits the most of the force from the hand. So this constricted area of the scaphoid, that's where it gets fractured. The fracture become more complicated because it gets its blood supply from its distal fragment, that means the blood vessel comes from the proximal end and enters the bone from the distal end. With the fracture here, it loses blood supply and what we get is the avascular necrosis.